um, when, when I was asking for somebody to do programs, which I'm asking everybody here to do it again, um, he volunteered to do this. So this is kind of a retrospective of his uh, career. And uh, he finished up, I think, retiring from Motorola. Is that correct? No. No? No, I, I retired from Next Step. Next Step? Oh, OK. Vice President of Engineering. <laughs> um, well, various people said to me, give a little bit of background of myself. I, uh, I'm a uh, British Army Major's uh, son. And uh, my dad and mum took me all over the world when, wherever he was posted. And I ended up, um, my last high school was in Singapore. And I had two years as a high school in Singapore and then took a three and a half week cruise back from Singapore to Southampton in England. And um, at that time I had been to 14 different schools. And the thought of starting another one at the age of 17 didn't sort of appeal to me at the time. <laughs> or indeed not going to college. So I said I want to get a job. And my dad took me along to uh, what they call the Youth Employment Bureau. And um, I had a letter from my headmaster, called principal. And um, he said that I was um, good at playing cricket <laughs> and swimming for the school. <laughs> and I'd won the school technical prize for woodwork, metalwork, and technical drawing. So. This lady said, well, it looks like you need to go into engineering of some sort or other. Mm. And she said, There's, um, do you fancy mechanical or electrical? Well, mechanical sort of conjured up ideas of being under a car and plunging grease. <laughs> so I wasn't too keen on that. So I said, no, what about electrical? She said, okay. So she goes through her, her um, file index cards there and comes. So we've got two jobs. One is uh, working for Mullard Radio Valves. It's a British company that made tubes. And the other one was for the GPO, to be an apprentice, or, um, for a two-year apprenticeship. And um, so there's both <coughs> application forms. I applied for both. I got invited to interview for both. But the GPO was the first, the GPO General Post Office, which subsequently became British Telecom when um, Ronald Reagan's girlfriend, called Maggie Thatcher, uh, <laughs> privatised it. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I, I ended up, and it was a two-year apprenticeship, and it was, um, looking back, it was great fun. But I mean, we started off poles and holes. So mm -hmm. you ended up climbing up the poles and running the, the wires. Then down the holes and twisting the cables together. Then you did a period of what they call subzap, which stands for subscribed apparatus, and we go into people's houses and fix the phones that have gone wrong. Um, after your first year of this apprenticeship, having tried a little bit of everything, you were asked what would you like to do, and I said I wanted to become a telephone exchange maintenance engineer. They said, okay, we can do that, and at the time, most of the telephone exchanges in England were what we call Strouger, Strouger step-by-step -step systems, um, where you dialed. And um, I, I actually went and worked in one of these. Now, I don't know whether you know, but um, Strouger was an American undertaker. He, um, he uh, was very upset because the operator of the local uh, switchboard, I can't remember what town is, somewhere in America, but um, the operator was in cahoots with his competitor. So whenever someone said, I need an undertaker, <laughs> she put them through to his competitor, and he got really fed up with this. So he invented the Strouger step-by-step -step system with a dial and electromechanical switches, which, as I say, is what the whole of England was running on at that time. So I went and for, for a year, my second year, I spent in a telephone exchange um, learning how to fault these things, the whole thing was electromechanical, how to trace calls through the system, how to fix faults, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of my two years, I became a technician grade two. And that, um, that meant that I could actually become a real technician and work in a, in a proper telephone exchange. However, I was pretty miffed because they put me in the last manual exchange. This is one, there was no electromechanical, this was still operators. Now, not quite like this lady. This lady has <laughs> a very old picture of a, of a switchboard operator. And way before my time, I might add, 
<laughs> they had to wear uniforms like this. <laughs> and, um, so anyhow, I I, uh, I went and worked in this um, uh, tele manual telephone exchange for 18 months. And then I, a few years ago, I joined what is called the Telecoms Heritage Group, who produces this journal four times a year. And it's sort of members sort of who collect old telephones. Some have got their own telephone exchanges in their garages or workshops, you know, and they, they just love all this old equipment and switchboards and things like that. And they're always asking for someone to write an article. So I thought, well, I'll tell them a little story about the nostalgia I have of when I went into this manual telephone exchange, which they actually published in, in this, um, this journal just come out. I mentioned this to Bob and Bob said, oh, I'm going to talk about it. So, so that's why I'm here. Anyhow, um, if we uh, press the button, Rob. This is um, Bolton, Bolton, a town in the north of England. And uh, this is a, um, what they call a magneto telephone exchange. Um, it's called magneto because every telephone line had a hand-generated magneto. And to make a call, you crank the handle, generated some AC, it went across the two wires into the telephone exchange where there would be a relay with a metal oxide rectifier across it, which would operate and a little flat would drop down by gravity. And behind it was the number of the customer who was making the call. Now, and these were also called, um, well, had individual batteries. So every telephone had its own Le Clanchet cells, which were sort of hot, hot with um, sal ammoniac in a zinc rod, and uh, you fill them up with water when they went dry. Um, <laughs> of course, you imagine when you've got sort of several thousand of these telephones, and these sort of old fashioned batteries at every installation, it became a bit of a maintenance liability. <laughs> um, so this one, if you'd like to do the next picture, Bob, um, this is the same exchange. Um, they were converting it from a magneto system to a central battery system. In other words, instead of every telephone line having its own battery, um, they would put a central battery, one <coughs> large battery, which would serve the purpose for all lines. <coughs> and uh, this is a picture of the exchange. In fact, um, let me make this thing work. Here is where all those drop flaps along here are. And when the uh, rang on, it's the turn ringing on and ringing off. Because you could ring off as well, and the flap would tell you to finish the call. And then up here is where they plug in. All the telephone lines appeared up here as well. You can see all these ladies. Now this is this is getting rather modern now because you see they've got these posh posh chairs. <laughs> <laughs> if you look if you look back at the previous one, you see they were all wooden ones with no <laughs> So anyhow, um, this was um old in nineteen twenty two. I don't personally remember it. Let's have the next one. And this is again Bolton, I'm looking at it from, from another angle, and one of the ladies, and you can see it's all plugs and um, cords. And, um, so, anyhow, um, I'm going to take a look at my notes here. Um, so, the central battery system basically had a, one battery, it's a 40 volt battery. Um, each cell, each battery, there was two two in parallel, each one would fill, each battery would fill this room. These were open cells about this high off the ground, this wide with all the lead plates in them, and you would uh, go and top them up with um, distilled water in the wind in the summer and just out of the tap in the winter. <laughs> um, so, and the way that worked was that, you know, you picked up the phone, you put a short circuit on the line, Another short circuit was actually by your microphone, your microphone and um, a light would come up on the switchboard. And the operator would plug in and say, number please. And then uh, you'd say what number you want. And if it was on the same exchange, 
she would get her the other plug of the pair and touch it on the ring of the socket. If it crackled in her ear, she said, I'm sorry, that line's engaged. <laughs> if it didn't crackle, then she'd plug in, <laughs> pull a key back, which would ring the line, and, um, and the, the, light, the light would stay on until the, the calling or call subscriber answered. When that happened, she pressed the button, which operated a meter, and stepped, which told her how many calls they made, because they used to charge for every call. Yeah. Unlike America, where locals are free, there they charge you a unit each time. Um, and if they're really fed up because they've got a rude customer on, they <laughs> press it a few times. <laughs> 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 I've never seen you do that. But anyhow, that, that, um, that's the old system. Let's go on to the next one. Did these women all become software programmers? Unemployment <laughs> <laughs> line? <laughs> Quite interesting. Because when I went into this telephone exchange, there was, I think, seven of us. And one old miserable old git who was the boss. <laughs> and the other six of us were sort of between the ages of sort of 19 and 23. And there was like 70 or 80 women in this switch room. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing was that uh, they had, the, you see, the, that was the main switchboard there. This is one before it was actually went live. And these little desks you see here are the, um, the supervisor's desks where they could go and listen to how the operators were performing as the, the actual connection to all the operators' headsets around the switch room. Yeah. Anyhow, they... Um, the call, so so the, the actual thing itself, this, this bit here is called the subscriber's multi. Right, and this is typically around about a 10,000 line exchange. And each subscriber's line appears on, mu on multiple occasions, like every panel all the way around. So any operator sitting at the switchboard is able to plug into any customer of the 10,000 lines. And um, in fact, in the old days, I was told, they, um, you could only get a job as a switchboard over if you were tall enough. <laughs> so, um, and that was that. These supervisors were sort of fearful people. I mean, um, what do I say? They were all ladies, and they all sort of were growing moustaches. <laughs> but anyhow, we, um, us lads used to have some fun in there, and uh, in the old days, the main thing we had to do on these switch was was repair the cords, because the operators used to <coughs> yank them out like that rather than pull the plug out as they should, because some of them were quite short. Yeah. And... Um, <coughs> So, so we, in the end, the plugs became noisy, the wire, and we, we'd have to change them. Well, in the old days, you'd take the plug on the end of the cord and poke it through a tube at the front of this switchboard here, and the poor old technician was round the back, and he'd see it come through the hole, through the tube, and then you'd cut it off, and you'd strip, strip it back a bit, wow. put some little eyelets on it, whip some waxed cotton on it and then screw it back into the plug and put the two little screws back in and then let it back to the operator. Well, we never did that. We got to, you know, thought it was just too much messing around, so we just changed the cords and we did it from the front. The sort of problems we used to have on these were quite interesting, right? This tube, which I talked about, was still there when I was working there, but it was a handy place to put your toffee papers and your sweet papers. You could just them through and they would sort of pop out the back when it was full. <laughs> um, the other thing they used to do with their toffee papers was to stick them up under the under the switchboard. I don't know where all the keys were. That was supposed to be locked, but it isn't. It wasn't always locked. Some of them you know, not all locked. Was locked. So they stuffed their toffee papers in there as well. <laughs> and uh, and the, the worst problem we used to have, I think, they had things called key senders. So. If, you, if someone was making a call, they'd pick the phone up, the light would come on, number please. And if it was in the same exchange, they'd plug in and do as I just described. But it might be to another telephone exchange. And this was probably one of the last, if not the last, telephone exchange. So they'd have to plug into an automatic exchange, and they had circuits and junctions, as we called them, to the other exchanges. And they had two <coughs> seconds, rather than have to dial, which took a bit of time, they had these key seconds. 
and there was W, X, Y, and Z tones. And these four tones were sent in a permutation <coughs> to determine, to, which determined what number we were sending. At the other end of that circuit was a, what we call a, a voice, BF, uh, voice frequency relay, which was like a, a literal mechanical thing, which had a little finger inside the bubble, and as the tone came in, each one was tuned to a different tone, it would go HR, a high resistance, and operate another relay, and then through a sort of a, a series of contact gates, would actually get it to pulse out the numbers to the step-by-step system. Well, when one of these tones went out, the whole switchboard was really screwed up. I mean, you couldn't work And I remember one occasion that happened, and well, one, one tone went off, and we worked out, we had the headset, we'd go around and listen to the U-links to which tone wasn't there, and we'd then go around pulling the backs, and you know, sort of big backs on each of these switchboards, pulling them out one at a time, until we got the one, the tone came back up, and sure enough, we knew the position where the top of the paper was. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, I, I, as I mentioned, when, let's have another, another picture of getting boring. Well, there's an operator working a CB number one, which is what they call it, central battery system number one. Um, and if you do the next one, Bill. And this is again the switch room. Uh, I think this is Bolton, was it Bolton? I don't know. Anyhow, this yeah. is after it went live. Mm -hmm. And um, the next one is the one I worked in. This is actually Elmbridge, which is in Surbiton, uh, South West London. And I can tell you that this picture was taken at night time because there were men there. <laughs> and the men used to do the night shift, and women, were, it was always women during the day. You've got a few women at night, but mostly it was men during the, during the night. Um, the worst problems that we used to have are when there was a fault in this switch, in this multiple. As you can imagine, the height of that, that's just a massive cable. And the cable was very old, I mean, this is 1923, so um, it, was, it wasn't a BBC cable, it was sort of cotton braided stuff that had been dipped in the wax. <coughs> And the, 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 the wires are extremely brittle. As I explained, the, um, the method of charging was to press a button if you made a local call. But you also could do um, toll calls or trunk calls, in which case you had to, they filled out a little docket. And this little docket said where the call was from, where it was to. They had timers on the front, you could work out how many minutes and seconds. So it's time and distance. And then they make up the ticket, and there'd be another department that would work out how much they can charge for this. To make these tickets out, originally they all, they all were supplied with pencils, lead pencils. And what they used to do was to sharpen that pencil, so it had a long bit of lead on the edge. And so you could plug the pencil into the multiple. <laughs> that would put a short circuit on the, the, you know, the A and B wires, the two wires, and it would light the bulb on the, uh, this, this bit here, the, uh, the main part where, on the bottom, this is where all the customers' lights were. And what would happen is they had a little label which was plugged next to the bulb, and that label said what the customer's number was. But these damn labels used to drop out. So what they do, they get their pointed pencil, stick it in the top, see which light came on, and put the label back in. And as they pulled the pencil out, it broke the lead quite often. <laughs> <laughs> and that piece of graphite <coughs> percolated through, through this thing. Now, they, they went over to bit pens at some point in time. That's what the was there. But these bits of lead were still inside the multiple. And in time, they worked their way down. And eventually, they would, they would cause a short of some sort of the other. Now, the proper way to do deal with that is to get these jacks and crank up all the cables, lift them up, get inside there's a screwdriver about this long, is a called a ring driver. You'd undo the screw and there'd be like a butterfly thing you turn around and then you pull the whole strip of the numbers out and clear the hole. Now jacking up all that cable effectively 
put the whole load of war forts on the boat and it was a pain in the neck. So we really didn't want to do that if we could avoid it. So what we had, we had a thing which we really, really troubled if anyone knew about it, was called a mains tester. It's a switchboard plug on one end and a 240 volts plug on the other. <laughs> so we plug it into the mains, plug this into the Fine, switch. Sure. We would <laughs> peg around all the ones, the multiple, and then one would stand at the one guy would stand at the front, the other would say, ready, yeah, okay, switch it on. We get a bang, a puff of smoke would come out of the room. And, and, and one of the women would scream. <laughs> so so you, you knew where the fault was. And you know, the doctor would say, you know, that's, that's what it is. And, um, but I'd say we would have been in trouble. But, but we saved a lot of problems that way because usually if we did it the right way, we'd, we'd be weeks and weeks lifting it up above and above where it. Everything above it would get wide. Now, now does that work with computers too? <laughs> <laughs> I can try.